they were both so concerned about trying to find an answer to schizophrenia. That was, that was the goal of that time. They had this theory that uh, schizophrenia was caused by something wrong in the person's biochemistry, that there was a physical cause to the illness. And up until that time, that was, um, nobody ever heard of such a thing. Of course, he was anathema to a lot of the establishment because the establishment at that time was still solidly, very solidly psychotherapy. And they thought these guys were just nuts that they were looking for, for something uh, physical in the illness. In the effort to link the psychological to the physical, Hoffer and Osmond took their research in unconventional directions. Uh, uh, Dr. Osmond heard that the native people were using peyote, the peyote cactus, for their group sessions. And he went up to a reservation up near North Battleford and asked to get in on it. And he and Hoffer went into a circle and took peyote, or Dr. Osmond took it that night, I think. And he got the feeling that there was a tremendous sense of empathy in the group. And so they tried to transpose that down to Weyburn, and the staff used to take it in groups. What I remember most about, about both Drs. Hoffer and Osmond is that they, uh, they, they spearheaded the, uh, the LSD experiments in the late 50s, early 60s in, in Weyburn, in, in the research unit in Saskatchewan Hospital, Weyburn. In a 1957 letter to his friend Aldous Huxley, Osmond wrote, To fathom hell or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. Huxley's nephew, Francis, worked at the hospital for five months administering LSD. Francis called and said, would you like to come over tonight and hear some music? I figured there'd be a gang there because they were all crowded around Francis Huxley when he was there, you see. When I got over, there was nobody else there. And I said, oh, nobody's here yet. And he said, you may be the only one that's coming. And I thought, that's odd. He said, can I make you a cup of tea? And I said, okay. And he said, or would you rather have LSD? I certainly got some perceptual changes, and then I got lost in the rug. <laughs> this was quite common, textures would drag you in. And then I got having emotional disturbances. I started feeling used. I started thinking of all the people that asked me for favors, and you know, I was getting almost paranoid. And I think at one time I went off the couch, I had my head on the couch and I was in a real despair. And I remember hearing Francis say, get up. He didn't sound too bossy, but he didn't want me to wallow like that, you know. And I, I got up, and sometime he gave me niacin. We could, we could bring somebody out of it with niacin. If I remember correctly, the original intent for, uh, for the LSD experiments was to assist people that uh, had substance abuse or addictions problems. LSD was administered in a controlled setting. The sitter, a sober observer, was assigned to care for those undergoing the drug's effects. I had a reputation as a good sitter, and uh, they thought it was because I had good concentration, I had a pretty long attention span, but I think it had something to do with the fact that I had been there enough that I kind of knew what they were going through. I think it did, I think it did increase empathy. Osmond himself, I think, took it too often because he didn't think you should try anything on anybody else unless you try it on yourself first, you know. And uh, he did some crazy things. See, Hoffer would never dreamt of doing some of these things. Like one day he took it with his dogs. No other people around, just him and his dogs under LSD. <laughs> I didn't tell that story. <laughs> it's a good thing he didn't walk into the river or something. The hospital has loomed on the edge of Weyburn for living memory. Despite its vital link to the city and its economy, those who live there must cope with the stigma attached to mental illness. I got, well, I got two sisters, eh? But I'm a, I'm not. We don't, we don't watch, watch with me because I was at the hospital. They don't want people to know that they're from there. They never let on. Even when I went to my mother's funeral, I was. I went there to see the, see the see the body, and the funeral home didn't didn't think it was right for me to see this lady's body because I'm not on the list, and I'm the son. Oh, the stigma was was tremendous. Um, I remember when I was discharged, the um, 
several people were being discharged at the same time and in our discussion group they talked about what we would have to face and I remember they said you guys are ambassadors you got to get out there and change the, the view you know I think the city sometimes felt uncomfortable about having that kind of notoriety. I recall traveling with my parents in, in the, the mid-60s uh, because my father always wanted to take us somewhere else in Canada and I still remember in Montreal we were with a cab driver and, and the cab driver was talkative and said, where are you from? And my father said, we're from Weyburn, Saskatchewan. Have you ever heard of that place? And the cab driver in, in broken English says, oh, Weyburn, sure, I know about Weyburn. And, you know, then my father provided him with some education about some of the other benefits to Weyburn and even benefits to, to Saskatchewan Hospital Weyburn. But we had for a period of time a, a national notoriety that probably made some people feel uncomfortable. I grew up here in Weyburn and I told ghost stories or horror stories when we were driving around this, uh, this place at midnight on a Friday or Saturday night and, and I did it to amuse people, maybe to, if, if we were with girls, to, to scare them um, and most of those stories were just that, they were stories. Oh yeah, well there's a hangman shack. I don't know if you know about that. Oh, well it's a shack. Oh, you can actually still go in it because they just have the, the actual building blocked off. But you go into like the tree area part and there's a shack and there's a beam and that's actually where they used to hang. Like if you wanted to go hang yourself, they can't stop you from suicide. So we might as well go to a shack and do it, I guess. Some people believe that those things were actually true. Um, that people killed other people here and, and there were all sorts of horrible and gruesome things that happened within the facility. And those are simply urban myths. I think that, you know, as the hospital started to sort of die out, now the old stories are around. This is a creepy place or something. I think it's one reason it was torn down. And, I think this, the stigma of the fact that it was a metal hospital, they forgot to see that it was a beautiful building and a very useful building, but it was a metal hospital. There have been a number of groups over the, over the past at least 10 years who wanted to save what has recently become known as, as Soros Valley. And while it's a noble idea, this building had 500,000 square feet of floor space. When you consider that that once housed hundreds and, and sometimes thousands of patients, the idea of 500,000 square feet, even today, speaks to the enormity of the building. I don't know what the average sized mall is, but I'll bet you dollars to donuts it's nowhere near 500,000 square feet. Uh, I wasn't able to, to view the building prior to them turning the, the heat off, but once you've turned the heat off and it's gone through a, a winter like you have here, um, it's almost impossible because the uh, the pipes burst, you get moisture, and in the, even in the spring this year, the uh, some of the floors uh, began to heave and separate where the building uh, connects, where the wings connect to the main structure. The building went through years, if not decades, of minimal renovations and by that I mean if the roof leaked it was patched but the entire roof needed to be replaced it was too big a building with too few people using it 
to make it worthwhile to maintain or to keep. The demolition is underway and the hospital's fate is sealed. The building has become a victim of the institution's success. Uh, Saskatchewan, again, can be proud of the legacy that, that the hospital left with the research. In going through all our different papers, it's amazing how the Weyburn Hospital ended up in so many international medical journals with the, the studies they had done. So I think on, a, on quite a few different levels, it's, it's leaving a legacy. What I hope is remembered is that over those, those multiple decades, the building is remembered as a place where people were housed, but where people were helped. The hospital in the 40s, with all its faults, had the feeling of a permanent community. It had cohesion. By asking me to play a creative and responsible role in a project which involved supposedly normal individuals working with patients, I was given the opportunity to see myself as a contributing member of society once more. I find it discouraging that the medical model has led psychiatry to a position of, you are sick, I can help you. When what is needed is a sense of, you can help me, you can contribute to the community.